So good evening Coventry. This short talk is called The Lighter Side of Astronomy and it's really just a collection of things that somewhere along the way have made me chuckle. So I'm going to be looking at the lighter side of astronomers and telescopes and observatories and we probably won't have much time for anything else as this is only going to be a short uh, 30 minute or so talk. So there probably won't be any miscellaneous. So some astronomers are scientists and in answer to the question do you think you have what it takes to be a scientist the answer according to Sir Patrick would be well we just don't know. But of course I'm a scientist and yes on the right hand side you can see pretty much what is going through my head all the time. Some astronomers are astrophysicists. These are people that have managed to take a wonderful hobby like astronomy and turn it into absolute gobbledygook. I'm assuming that you all are perfectly okay with what's on the blackboard here. This is just standard astrophysics stuff. I'm going to start from this level and then slowly ramp up for the rest of the half hour, if that's okay with you. <laughs> so, we all know that astronomers and scientists and astrophysicists are quite keen on classifying things. So for instance, we can take all the stars and we can classify them on a Hertzsprung-Russell or an HR diagram. We can, plot, we can plot the positions of the stars according to their luminosity on the vertical scale and their temperature on the horizontal scale. And the temperature for historical reasons is plotted backwards with the low temperature on the right and the high temperature on the left. And doing this we see the main sequence of stars and we see supergiants in the top and we see some dwarfs in the bottom. Why am I showing you this? Well because a little while ago some people thought about this and said well if astronomers are keen to classify stars using this sort of a diagram why don't we classify astronomers the same way? So here's an HR diagram of astronomers and now the axes are the vertical scale, what used to be luminosity, is now, if you like, the luminosity of the astronomer. In other words, the fame. How do we quantify the famousness of an astronomer? Well, we put their name into Google and see how many hits we get. What about the horizontal scale? Again, from right to left, uh, to mirror the original HR diagram, now we have the scientific output of said Oh, so we have somebody in the waiting room waiting to come in. Okay, so the horizontal scale is the scientific output of said astronomer. In other words, how many peer-reviewed scientific papers they have published, presumably either to date or during their lifetime. This was made a few years ago, so it's not necessarily up to date. So we have a few individuals. Remember the vertical scale is fame and the further left we go the more scientifically productive these individuals were. So I'll just give you a couple of seconds to ask you who do you think that is in the top left? Right at the top end of the diagram as it were maximum fame and about as far left as you can go having published some 300 scientific papers. I'll just give you a couple of seconds. I won't ask for a show of hands. Who do you think that individual is? That is Carl Sagan. Very famous, of course, for his 1980s Cosmos series and also very prolific as a scientist. Right next door on this diagram, just as famous, if not slightly more so, perhaps a few less papers, maybe a couple of hundred scientific papers, that is Stephen Hawking. If we move over towards the middle of the diagram, we get to this individual, that is Brian Cox, almost as famous as Hawking and Sagan, but of course scientifically he's a TV presenter these days rather than a scientist, so rather less output. And an individual, if we carry on and go over to the right hand side, I'm not even sure why that individual is there, almost as famous as Brian Cox, but scientifically zero output, so this individual is not a scientist, but they're classified as an astronomer simply because they have presented, I guess, a TV programme on astronomy. That star there on the right is Mylene Klaas. <laughs> 
There are other individuals you might recognise, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Chris Lintott, Jocelyn Belvanel, for instance. I thought it was interesting to present people in this particular way, in terms of how much people know them, as well as how scientifically productive they have been. But when it came to looking at this diagram, I thought to myself, hmm, I wonder. If I was on that diagram, where would I be? So I haven't produced astronomical scientific papers, but I have produced scientific papers, and the axis says peer-reviewed scientific papers. It doesn't say they have to be in astronomical journals. So given that I've published over a hundred papers, I thought, I wonder where I would be on the diagram. I'm not going to be up there with the supergiants, but am I going to be down at the bottom there, these dark astronomers who have produced something but are completely unknown? So I did what everybody does at sooner or later in their life. You put your name into Google and you see what you get. Searching for Steve Barrett doesn't help because there are lots of Steve Barretts in the world. Searching for Dr. Steve Barrett doesn't help either because there's more than one Dr. Steve Barrett, uh, a famous one in America and others dotted around the world. So I searched for Dr. Steve Barrett Liverpool to try and make sure it was only finding me rather than anybody else with a similar name. And that produced, according to Google, about 5,000 hits. So I thought, right, now I have uh, a number. 5,000 hits puts me where? 5,000 on this scale is around here, and with 100 or so, 110 scientific papers, that means I end up somewhere around where the cursor is. And that yellow star indicates where I would be on this diagram. Not up there with the supergiants, but at least I'm not down there with the dark astronomers. I am slap bang in the middle of the main sequence. Confirming what I've known all along, I'm a rather mediocre scientist. So let's have a look at a few cartoons, shall we? This one made me chuckle. A caveman looking through a hollow log. No, nope, moon looks the same. You say this is the most powerful one you have? It's funny for that reason, because this individual is looking through a hollow log which has a magnification of approximately times one. 1.000 probably. But that's not what made me laugh. Two things made me laugh. On the right hand side we can see a telescope in the background that clearly is a hollow log and strapped to the side of this hollow log is a smaller hollow log. A finder log if you like. Even though they both have a magnification of times one, the idea is that it might be useful to put a small log strapped to the side of a big log. The second thing that made me laugh more than the main joke is the fact that clearly the caveman on the left wants to buy one of these telescopes and it's also clear that the gentleman on the right, the caveman on the right, is clearly the salesman. You can tell because A he's got a coiffured haircut and B this caveman is wearing a tie. That tells you that this is a salesman. Fantastic. Let's have a look at some ancient astronomical devices, such as a sundial, for instance. Here we can see an individual noticing that a partial eclipse phase is starting, and then uh, during a total eclipse, of course, everything goes dark. And maybe a short time later, the sun returns back into the partial phase and light returns to the Earth. But at that point, he finds that he has to call out the sundial repairman. Why? Well, because when the sun returned, it right, happened right after the eclipse, it just keeps blinking 12 o'clock. A nice idea for anybody that's ever switched off a microwave oven. And of course, a sundial isn't the only astronomical device we know about. We're familiar with this idea of stone circles. Are they clocks? Are they calendars? Well, maybe they're both. But here, one of the architects is saying to the other, remember, when summertime ends, we have to give everything a slight turn to the left. Again, a very nice idea for Stonehenge. Here we have a couple of individuals who are trying to work out how those stones got moved. How do you make Stonehenge? How could you possibly move these massive stones? Again, Sir Patrick might say, Well, we just don't know. But the hint here is, if you look very carefully on the left-hand side, you can see how those stones were moved. Let's have a look at a few individuals. We haven't got time to cover them all, so let's just pick a few individuals out of the many astronomers that we know about. 
Galileo, of course, not just an astronomer, but a scientist who believed that if you want to know how the world works, you do experiments. You don't work out what should happen, you actually find out what does happen. And he's famous for, perhaps apocryphally, throwing cannonballs off the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa, trying to work out if large and small objects hit the ground at the same time. Aristotle said they shouldn't, he did the experiments to try and work out if they did. But he had to rely on timing, of course, of a relatively short period here in terms of how long it takes the cannonballs to drop. And some people have speculated, well, he had very crude measuring devices. How on earth did he do his experiments? What if there were computers in Galileo's time? Would that have advanced science and perhaps astronomy if Galileo had had access to computers? Some say yes. And some say, well, the only difference it would have made is, if you look at the top of the tower, it would have been the computers that got thrown off the top rather than cannonballs, and then you see which one hits the ground and smashes first. With Newton, everybody knows the story of Newton sitting in the orchard outside Woolsthorpe Manor, contemplating nothing in particular, and then an apple falls on his head, and he starts to think about gravity. So Newton discovers gravity in Lincolnshire. But it is not often appreciated that later that same afternoon, shortly after he discovered gravity, he also discovered comedy. And for those of you with a particular sense of humour, again, later that evening, Newton discovered surrealism. And the idea of a grand piano falling out of a tree, I just thought was hilarious. What about this chap. I'm sure you all recognise him. Of course, this is Carl Sagan, who we mentioned in the HR diagram uh, a little while ago. And Gary Larson from the far side had this cartoon of a young Carl Sagan. Just look at all those stars. There must be hundreds of them. And for those that don't understand that cartoon, you haven't heard Carl Sagan give his wonderful narration during Cosmos or indeed any other programme. And what about telescopes? Let's move on from people to things. Here we have a wonderful design of a telescope. I've got no idea if it ever existed. I, I probably doubt it. But it's a very interesting design. If you look at it, you can work out that not only does it have adjustments for different latitudes, but because of the way the right ascension and declination axes have been arranged, they intersect at the eyepiece. Which means no matter where this telescope points, your head effectively doesn't have to change position regardless of right ascension, regardless of declination. Once you've found a convenient viewing position, your eye can always remain at the same height. That's obviously not true for various other telescope designs. And of course, in past centuries, amateurs have been very good at making telescopes. Some people have put their heart and soul into making an astronomical telescope, such as this reflecting telescope there. Though you could argue, is it really a good idea to make a reflecting telescope with so many other reflecting surfaces other than the mirror itself? Well, maybe. But this individual made this telescope out of, I believe, stainless steel and titanium, very difficult materials to work with, and yet they produce something which is functional and a work of art. Some amateur telescope makers, oh well, really, they haven't got a clue what they're doing. What about the smallest telescopes around? If you think about a fork-mounted telescope, perhaps some of you might have a fork mount uh, There's the waiting room again. Yeah, but it keeps coming up with a banner on my screen. So we're talking about a fork-mounted telescope. Some of you might have a fork-mounted telescope. One of the smallest fork-mounted telescopes I could find was, was this one where the telescope is mounted onto a fork, clearly, and the fork is glued to a knife and a spoon. So you have not only a tripod, you have the fork mounting as well. Very nice, very compact. What a great idea. And if you ask what is probably the best telescope in the world, certainly at the small end of the spectrum, you can perhaps guess from the caption, probably the best telescope in the world. Well, clearly that has to be a Carlsberg beer can. Take the top off, put a telescope in the bottom of the can, put a 45 degree mirror on the eyepiece, and now you have a small Newtonian telescope. I'm told that this was actually functional, but I don't believe the optical quality was perhaps up to the sort of quality that we would expect. 
And of course for some people one telescope is not enough, so why not make yourself two telescopes, put them side by side in a sort of Dobsonian mount, and then you end up with a huge pair of binoculars, which I'm sure must give you superb pseudo three-dimensional views of the sky. And some people have taken that beyond that size to something, I'm not too sure what the size of the mirror is, maybe that is 16, 20 inch, something like that, and you can see that the uh, the eyepieces at the top end there you would need to be on a little bit of a step ladder to be able to get to the focus of this particular pair of binoculars. But for some people even two is not enough and for getting a large telescope rather than buying a telescope with a very large aperture mirror or lens people have taken a different approach and have said well there are commercial lenses available photographically from Nikon, Canon, whatever and this is a 400mm f2.8 Canon lens and if you bought that and put a camera on the back you'd have a very nice astrophotography system and you could put more than one of them on a mount so why limit yourself to one or two when you can put ten of them on a substantial mount like this and of course with ten telephoto lenses if you wished you could have ten cameras on the back and if you wish you could have them all with perhaps different filters. You could have one camera taking images in H-alpha and another camera and lens taking images at the same time in oxygen line. You could have other cameras taking red V and B. You could have another camera or two taking luminosity and you can take them all simultaneously rather than the usual idea of a filter wheel where you take one, change the filter, take another image, change the filter, take another. So this allows you to take a lot of images in parallel and it's perhaps not quite the same as one large aperture but it has the advantage that depending on your financial situation you might have enough money to buy one and then start operating and then if money becomes available you can buy a second and then a third and then a fourth and you can build it up slowly which of course you can't do if you want to buy one large aperture telescope. And there's no reason why you should stop at 10. Why stop there when you can go to 24? and you end up with something that looks like a, dragonfl a dragonfly's eye. Let me get rid of that again. So we have a, a 24 in this dragonfly arrangement. And th again, that was built that way to give the flexibility of building it up bit by bit. We know that size matters. We're always, as amateur astronomers, interested in the largest telescope to collect the largest amount of light and some individuals build Dobsonians that are the same size as the individual, but this individual thought, why stop at something that's only sort of two meters high when you can build something like this? That looks like a very dark sky site. I would imagine there's no light pollution looking at the environment there. And I would imagine in the pitch black, it would be a little bit scary going up that uh, step ladder in order to get to the eyepiece of this rather huge Dobsonian. But we can ask ourselves what's the largest telescope ever made in terms of a refractor. We know that mirrors are getting larger and larger and of course all large telescopes these days are mirrors. But what was the largest refractor ever made? Most people tend to think of the 40 inch Yerkes refractor. But actually the largest refractor is actually this one which had a 48 inch lens so it was larger than the Yerkes refractor by quite a few inches. And the telescope was so large it was mounted horizontally and exhibited at the 1900 uh, World Exhibition in Paris. And here we can see the telescope mounted horizontally and light is directed into the telescope using this siderostat mirror. And the linkages in the background there move the mirror so that the object of interest, uh, the light, shone through the telescope. In the top here you can see how the building was constructed. The telescope itself is sitting down the middle of the building on these piers. The siderostat is on the left hand side directing light into the telescope and on the right hand side there the eyepiece at the end of the telescope if used in eyepiece projection would then project an image onto this huge screen in the auditorium. A bit like a big IMAX cinema of the 1900s. I would imagine that would only work well for the moon and the sun, but I'm sure the images would have been absolutely spectacular for most of the audience who had never seen anything like that before. In the bottom here you can see the eyepiece at the end of the telescope in a little more detail. 
If we look down the telescope, now the objective is at the far end of the exhibition hall, and you can see the near end doesn't have an eyepiece, it has the photographic plate. These photographic plates looked like they were something like 24 inches square or something like that, absolutely huge. And there is the eyepiece holder. I couldn't find an image of the actual eyepiece itself, but you can see from the aperture there and the scale from the gentleman on the left, you can see just how big the eyepieces would have been. We are not talking one and a quarter or two inch eyepieces for this particular beastie here. After the Great Exhibition in 1900, as far as I know, it was dismantled. So a great shame. So yes, the Yerkes 40 inch is the, is the largest telescope that was in continuous use. This was built for the exhibition. And then after the exhibition, the 48 inch lens, I think, was just put in a museum. And the metal telescope itself was just sold for scrap. What a shame. Of course, not everybody works in metal. Some people work in wood. And if you are a skilled woodworker, why would you not think of making a full-scale model of the Hubble Space Telescope? Most people's garages aren't big enough, so it looks like this gentleman has rented a warehouse in order to reconstruct a full-scale model of the Hubble Space Telescope in plywood. OK, each to his own. Some people are a little less ambitious and uh, people make, for instance, Dobsonian telescopes. This looks more like a cannon, but that is a Dobsonian telescope. Some people prefer to buy the optical tube assembly and then make their own equatorial mount, for instance, because they think they have the skills to make a mount, but perhaps not the skills to make the optical tube itself. And certain individuals take craftsmanship to a new level. Russell Porter, for instance, made this garden telescope, which is not only functional with a mirror in the base part here and a 45 degree mirror up here and a small eyepiece. So it's a small Newtonian telescope, but it's clearly designed as well to be a garden ornament. And when you take craftsmanship to that level, you can ask yourself, well, do you want to leave it exposed to the elements or do you want to put um, your telescope, not necessarily this one, but whatever telescope you've built, do you want to put it into an observatory? There's Palomar Mountain housing the five metre or 200 inch telescope, a beautiful setting. I visited that telescope in 1982. I was extremely impressed by not only the telescope, which was the largest telescope in the world for most of my life, but also I thought, what a fantastic observatory. Back in 1982, when I was a student, I looked at that and I thought, one day, one day, I'm going to own a house with a garden big enough to put one of those in the back garden. OK, I had to downsize my aspirations slightly, and a few years later, in 1998, I bought myself a house which had enough room in the back garden for an 8x6 B&Q shed, which was converted into an observatory by putting a hole in the bottom to go over the telescope pier, and I converted the roof such that it had hinged panels to expose the telescope to the sky. So looking down on the inside there, that picture was almost certainly taken shortly after the observatory was completed. I can tell that mainly because it is clean and there were no spiders in there. So that must have been taken shortly after I finished it. You can tell that's 20 years old, not necessarily from the telescope, but from the laptop in the background there, which looks more like a house brick than it does the thin things that are called laptops these days. So I took a commercial shed and converted it into an observatory, but some people, again, have craftsman skills far beyond what I could bring to, the, to this particular type of uh, problem. And some people just say, if you want to build an observatory, this is the way you should do it. You don't go out and buy a fiberglass dome, not when you're capable of making a wooden dome with this beautiful geodesic structure. So absolutely fantastic way of homing a telescope in your back garden. But of course, the problem is your back garden might suffer from light pollution. So although it's convenient to have an observatory, a little dome in your back garden, perhaps that's not the best place from which to do astronomy. Maybe you want to actually go somewhere to a dark sky site where you can carry out your stargazing. It's a shame you can't take the observatory with you. Well, 
there is the possibility of that. Again, I'm not too sure if that was commercially available or whether this is just a, uh, a DIY job, but it looks like we have a wonderful hybrid here of a caravan with an observatory. And if your car is big enough, you just tow that around the country to whatever dark sky site you want to observe from. You do your observing, and when you've had enough, you just go next door and flop in the bed. Fantastic. Everything you need in one place. Maybe your car isn't quite big enough to tow anything that looks fairly massive. Uh, maybe you'd think of taking something a little bit smaller if you wanted a dome, but something not quite that size. Is there another possibility? Well, you can get smaller domes that you can tow around, for instance, that. Okay, that might be more designed for a small telescope rather than a small telescope and six people, but still, if that's what you want, small portable domes are available. But of course, you don't absolutely need a dome if you're going to a dark sky site. You just need a telescope that's capable of being moved. And there are plenty of telescopes such as this. I'm not sure you'd call it a go-to telescope. But looking at the wheels, I don't know if you need a license to drive this one. But this looks like it can go pretty much anywhere. Uh, and then when you get to where you want to be, then you can do your observing. It's not the earliest example of a go-to telescope I could find. This looked like a rather amazing beast. It looks like something like maybe an 8-inch refractor sitting on top of this car. That is quite a beast of a telescope. You look at that and you think, well, surely that's not much use because surely the telescope can't tilt very high and see at a very great altitude above the horizon. Well, yes, there's a crank handle there, so if you wanted to, you could crank it up and then you can get a decent elevation on that. So, whether this is a publicity stunt or whether this car really did exist and whether anybody actually used this telescope for real, I don't know. You can imagine that it wouldn't be particularly stable if it's sitting on the suspension of the car. Maybe you'd need something else to steady the car. But you could argue no one in their right minds is going to take a large telescope and stick it on the roof of a car. That is just a silly thing to do. Nobody's going to do that. Unless you're American, in which case it makes perfect sense whatsoever. And here we see a similarly sized refractor sitting on top of a Volvo. I noticed that this individual has put a little block of wood under the rear bumper, presumably to try and stop the car rocking too much whilst he's doing his observing. This gentleman lived in Florida when this picture was taken, so maybe he liked to drive out into the middle of nowhere to do his astronomy. Is that the largest example you can find of a telescope that is fully mobile? Well, no. But it's cheating to say the largest one I could find is actually that one, NASA's SOFIA Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, where the telescope is poking out of the back there. You can see the hatch is open and the infrared telescope is staring into the sky whilst the 747 goes flying around the world, trying to stay above most of the atmosphere that would absorb the infrared light. So we're, we're sort of deviating somewhat from amateur telescopes here. That would set you back a cool 100 million or so. And so we are getting outside the realm of what I started in this talk. So I think this is a good time to wrap up and acknowledge the fact that I've taken various cartoons and jokes, etc. from these various web pages. And you can go and visit them if you wish, if you want to find other things that might find you uh, make, might make you chuckle along the way. So thank you for listening. That's the end of my first talk this evening.